what's happening inside of Magna. I know that's a very Zen statement, but the weirdest thing about magnetic fields in general is that in order to create a magnetic field, you must be in motion. And in order to respond to a magnetic field, you must also be in motion. Magnetic fields and motion go together like two things that go together. I don't have any examples off the top of my head, but you get the idea. Magnetism in motion. If you just have an electric charge just hanging out, minding its own business, that electric charge will have an electric field. This electric field will point in all directions, and if you're another charge, you will respond to that electric field, all right? But if you send that charge in motion, if you give it a little flick, a little kick, if it starts moving, then it will start to generate a magnetic field. And this magnetic field is always perpendicular to the direction of motion. So if a charge is coming right at you like this, the magnetic field wraps around it as almost like a cylinder or a helix. There's a bunch of ways to visualize this, this magnetic field being generated by this moving charge. So how can a bar magnet that is very obviously not moving have a magnetic field? Well, the answer is what's happening microscopically. Yes, macroscopically, this bar magnet that I like stick on my fridge is not moving around, obviously, but the things inside of it are moving. So this bar magnet is made of molecules atoms. The atoms have protons and neutrons and they have electrons. And electrons have some very fundamental properties. If, if you just needed to, to list the fundamental properties of an electron, there'd be its mass, there'd be its charge, its electric charge, and there would be its spin. The spin is the name we give to a fundamental property of the electron. In fact, a fundamental property of all particles where when describing spin, it's very easy to use analogies, and I'm about to use an analogy, but don't let the analogy tell you too much because it can lead you astray. Spin is fundamentally a very quantum thing. Spin is fundamentally not something that we have a good intuition for. You can pretend, however, you can pretend that an electron is a tiny little metal ball that is spinning really fast. And you can pretend that this tiny little metal ball has a charge on it, it's spinning really fast, and it's also orbiting its atomic nucleus. Now, electrons don't really orbit atomic nuclei, and I have no idea how this picture of electrons orbiting nucleus become, became like the, the logo for science, even though it's 100 years out of date, but whatever, that's a different episode. The electrons aren't really orbiting the nucleus. They're not really spinning on their axis like a tiny, tiny little planet in its little tiny microscopic solar system. It's absolutely not doing that. And if you think it's doing that, then you this line of thinking will lead to some conclusions and predictions that violate experiment so you know you're wrong. But for the purposes of magnetism, we can pretend that this is exactly what's going on. So we're just playing pretend because when it comes to magnetism, this picture works. And if you have a charge, like a little metal ball that's spinning really fast, it has electric charge on it, that is charge in motion that gives you a magnetic field. So each individual electron tiny little electron has a magnetic field associated with it. Aha. In a normal material, like you know, my shirt or this desk or the chalkboard or whatever, the electrons like to pair up. Well, there'll be one electron that spins up and it will be matched with an electron that spins down. Their magnetic fields cancel each other out. So you get no net magnetism. If I measure the magnetic field of this desk, I'm not really going to measure much. Some materials, however, have 
unpaired electrons, like, like bachelor or bachelorette electrons, free-floating electrons. Now, most of the time, most materials, when this happens, the electrons can do whatever they want. They have all sorts of weird random orientations. And again, there's no magnetic field. But in some very special materials that we call, say, permanent magnets, they're all the electrons, or at least most of the electrons, line up together. They boom, 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 boom. And you can add magnetic fields together. So you get a tiny little contribution from this one, a tiny one, a tiny one, a tiny one, a tiny one. You add it up together and you get a big magnetic field. And the shape of this magnetic field is exactly what you would expect from having a bunch of little charged metal balls spinning around and orbiting their atomic nuclei. So for that purposes, this is how you get the big magnetic field. Now, a, a magnet like a fridge magnet is made of strips of material so that they alternate back and forth so that on one side, the magnetic fields add up together. And this is the side you attach to your fridge. And then the other side, they cancel out. This is the side you put the, the cheesy souvenir on. And the electrons in the metal of your fridge are mostly uncoordinated doing whatever the heck they want. But in the presence of a strong magnetic field, they line up together and then they produce their own magnetic field. And then these two magnetic fields are able to lock together and you get this wonderful effect of being able to stick a fridge magnet onto your fridge, even though the magnet itself isn't moving. It's because the magnetic field of your fridge magnet is made up of a bunch of tiny, tiny little charges in motion that generate their own magnetic field and get to add together to create a big magnetic field. So there you go. That's how magnets work. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please don't forget to like and subscribe and make sure notifications are turned on so you know when I go live. And also go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. There's a link somewhere around my face right now so you can keep these videos coming. Thank you.